Well, this is the third time we're having some kind of service on a screen. Uh, this morning, I'm not in Hebron, I'm not in an empty church. Instead, I'm in my house. On Monday evening, our Prime Minister requested that we stay in our houses except for shopping for necessities, daily exercise and any medical needs. Uh, there is guidance indicating a minister of religion can go to their place of worship for the purpose of a broadcast. But I think the spirit of what's been asked of us is to avoid going out unless absolutely necessary. And so it's not absolutely necessary to do this from the church building. I can do it from home. And so hopefully it's uh, Sunday morning, it's about half past ten with you, and uh, together uh, we're apart, but together we can worship. Uh, so we'll begin with prayer. Father God, uh, be with us as we come to our worship this morning. Uh, bless us in our homes as we sing and read your word. Uh, give us understanding of what your word says, and we ask that you would change us by it. Uh, we ask that you would draw close to us in these difficult and unusual times, and work in us and change us so that you might have all the glory and praise. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll sing. Uh, the words will be on your screen, but some of you are listening from a phone line, and so you can't see the words. And so you might have a red book or a white book at home. If you have uh, the red book, the number is 791. If you have a white book, the number is 842. Uh, so we'll sing the hymn, From Deep Distress I Cry to You. It's number 842. Uh, it says this, let me read the words. From deep distress I cry to thee, Lord, hear me, I implore thee. We're in a time of deep distress at the moment, uh, but this hymn tells us the most terrible disease of all, the disease of sin, uh, can be dealt with by the Lord Jesus Christ. Bend down thy gracious ear to me, regard my prayer before thee. If thou shouldst look on all my sin and mark down every wrong within, who, Lord, could stand before thee? But we have uh, the wonderful gift of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we'll sing this hymn, From Deep Distress I Cry to Thee. Thank you. 
here in the garden. Um, what lessons can we learn out here in the garden? The garden is springing to life. So it's a nice sunny day, the sun is out. Um, it's wonderful to be outside and you can see signs of spring. There's uh, daffodils over here. So spring has started. And, uh, and over here, this little bush, whatever it is, I don't know what it is, it's, uh, it's come to life. It's got lovely white blossom on it. And over the next few weeks that will change and there'll be green leaves on there. And then this plant here looks pretty dead at the moment. Um, winter has taken all the leaves off, but if you look very closely, if I could ask my camera crew to come a little bit closer, you can see tiny little buds are appearing, and in a few weeks' time, those will have opened up into lovely pink flowers. And so the garden reminds us of it reminds us of death in the world. So in the winter, the leaves fall off and uh, and land on the floor, uh, but then spring comes and uh, we get new life. And if you remember, on Sunday mornings, we've been going through Romans chapter eight, and we learned that creation is groaning. And maybe the garden reminds us about creation's groaning. Winter comes, it's groaning, it's trying to produce new life, and uh, new life does come, but then the winter will come next year, and uh, here we are, we've got these dead leaves, I need to sort this little bush out. Um, death will come again. And so all of creation is, is groaning, but the Bible promises that things will get better. A day is coming when Jesus Christ will return. Now let me show you something over here. Over here, we've got a rainbow. So Esme, with her chalks, has drawn a rainbow on our back step, and uh, it's a lovely little rainbow. You might have seen rainbows um, in people's windows, people have put rainbows there. What's the significance of a rainbow? Well, after a storm, after heavy rain, you get rainbows in the sky. And uh, the rainbow shows, well, everything's okay. In the Bible, a rainbow was the sign of the covenant God made with Noah. So let me read it to you. God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you. God was promising that the world would never be destroyed by a great flood again. And in fact, God said when he sees a rainbow, he will remember. Now, of course, God doesn't forget, but what it means is this, God will keep his promise. It says this in Genesis 9, whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all the living creatures of every kind on the earth. God says, I'll see the rainbow and I'll remember the promise I made, the promise that the, the world would never be destroyed. People, men and women, animals would never be destroyed by a big flood again. God is true to his promises. Uh, God is true to what he's promised to do. And uh, it reminds us, a rainbow reminds us of God's mercy. God has promised to be merciful in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we trust in him, God says we can have our sin forgiven. We can be right with him. And we can know a better world to come, uh, where there will be no more death, where there will be an eternal spring, where there will be life forevermore. We'll sing again. It's 760 in the red book and 803 in the white book. O oh, love, that wilt not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. And then verse 3 says, O oh, joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain, that morn shall tearless be.
We'll turn now to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you that we can turn to you now in prayer. We thank you that in our deep distress we can cry out to you. And we thank you for the sign of the rainbow, uh, the sign of your covenant with Noah, a reminder that you do not forget your promises. And so we thank you for the promises of your word, uh, that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. Uh, you have promised that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And therefore we know that even on another Sunday like this, where again we are unable to meet together and it feels like everything's been turned on its head, we thank you that we can still rejoice. Uh, things could be worse. If there wasn't a, a saviour for sin, uh, things would be worse. We would know the shadow of death, but we would have no hope. And so we rejoice this morning because we can face the shadow of death knowing that there is a saviour. Uh, we rejoice that you have given to us the gift of your Son who came to rescue your people from sin. Uh, we've sung the words of that hymn uh, this morning. If thou shouldst look on all my sin and mark down every wrong within, who, Lord, could stand before thee? Uh, and so we thank you that we can have hope in the Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can hope in him, uh, not in mine own merit. We pray this morning that we would know what it is to rest in Christ. If we have never gone to him, uh, Lord, we pray this morning that you would open our eyes to see our need of him and you would draw us to the Saviour. Bless us then, we pray. We pray this morning uh, that you would give to us a sense of your presence in our own homes, even grant to us a sense of fellowship with your people, uh, even though we are apart. Uh, we pray that you would give to us your peace in the midst of our worry and anxiety, in all of our fear, in all of our loneliness. Uh, we pray again this morning for our leaders, for our Prime Minister. Uh, we pray for our government in London and here in Wales. We pray for those who advise them. Uh, we ask that you would give them wisdom. Uh, we pray for those who are managing the health service and our local authority. Uh, we pray that you would give them strength in their uh, weariness. Uh, we pray for our doctors and nurses, especially in this part of Wales. We've been warned this week that our own little part of Wales could suffer especially. And so we ask that you would equip us and uh, give energy to all who work in our hospitals. Uh, and Lord, we pray too for the dying. Uh, we pray for families unable to be with their loved ones when they so very much want to be with them. Lord, we ask that dying men and women would come to know our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and thus die in peace. And so, Lord, we ask that you would extend your grace and mercy. Uh, we know that your word tells us you can give to us um, all that we ask. Uh, we thank you for the promise that you give um, to every sinner, that if they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. And so we pray that at this time you would be with us in a very real way. We thank you that you can awaken people and you can get their attention. And we pray that at this moment uh, we would know of men and women seeking the safety and refuge of Jesus Christ. And so be with us, we pray. Uh, be with our own congregation here at Hebron and all associated with it. Uh, we pray that you would give to us what we need and keep us looking to you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll read from God's word. Uh, we're going to read from Philippians chapter 4. So we began last week to look at uh, Philippians chapter 1. And uh, we'll read from Philippians chapter 4. And uh, we'll begin reading at uh, verses 10 to 20. So we're reading from chapter 4 but we'll return to verse 1 in a moment. So Philippians 4, verses 10 to 20. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, 
but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, at this time in which we can't meet together in our usual way, however long this will be, I thought we could look, um, to begin with at least, at the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to Philippi. And so last week we looked at uh, verses 1 to 8 in our morning and evening services. This morning I want us to look at verses 9 to 11. Uh, so I'll just read verses 9 to 11. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Well as I said our church is empty. Uh, our Prime Minister asked last Monday if we could work at home if possible um, according to the guidance, I said this a moment ago, I could go to the church building for this, but it is possible to do this from home. Uh, so I'm preaching to you from my house. It's not just churches that are empty. Uh, we had a little party plan for one of our children. It was his birthday, and so he was planning on going to watch Cardiff City with a few of his friends. I had the tickets ready, but then everything changed. Uh, all football has been suspended. Empty churches empty football grounds. This is not a time for playing football. That phrase, uh, this is not a time for playing football, is something that was said at the outbreak of the First World War. On August the 28th, uh, 28th uh, 1914, I've got it in a book here, um, a man called uh, Field Marshal Lord Roberts, he was a, a, a man who had been awarded the, the Victoria Cross for bravery, um, he made the following remarks to a gathering in London. Uh, he was addressing a, a newly formed battalion, uh, which was largely made up of businessmen based in the city of London. And uh, these were his words to that battalion on that day. He said this, How very different is your action to that of the men who can still go on with their cricket and football, as if the very existence of the country were not at stake? This is not the time to play games, wholesome as they are in times of peace. We are engaged in a life and death struggle. Uh, well, this coronavirus has been uh, likened to war by politicians across the world and therefore, as in 1914, this is not the time to play games. It was quite refreshing, I think, a couple of weeks ago to hear the comments of uh, Jurgen Klopp in a press conference. So if you are unaware as to who Jurgen Klopp is, uh, he is the manager of Liverpool Football Club and this is Liverpool's year. Uh, this is the year Liverpool fans have been waiting for. The last time Liverpool won the league was, I can tell you exactly how long, if you're watching now on, uh, on Sunday morning, it was 29 years, uh, 329 days ago since Liverpool Football Club last won the league. And so this is the season that's been so big for them. It's been so big for Liverpool because they've been so far ahead. Well, 
Jurgen Klopp was in this press conference and uh, somebody asked him about coronavirus and this is what he said. He said this, look, what I don't like in life is that a football manager's opinion is important. I don't understand it. I really don't understand it. And uh, he says this to the journalist, it's not important what famous people say. We have to speak about things in the right manner. Not people with no knowledge like me talking about something. People with knowledge should talk about it and should tell the people do this or do this and everything will be fine or not. Not football managers. My opinion is really not important. If somebody tells me we play football, we play football because I think smarter people said we can play football, I will not make the decision. Now I think that's the right spirit, isn't it? As someone has said this is not a time for playing football and therefore, like Jurgen Klopp, we should listen. Uh, this is not uh, a time for meeting together as a church and therefore we should listen to what's been asked of us. Now last week, as I said, we began to look at Philippians chapter 1 and we said there was something very fitting about this epistle for our circumstances at the present time. We looked at Acts chapter 16 and we saw that Paul had never intended to visit Philippi. Uh, Paul had his plans but God had his plans and God overruled and uh, for many of us perhaps, well very much our plans have been altered uh, but that doesn't mean that God isn't at work. He continues to do his work. He continues to bellow at men and women. He bellows at them, if you like, to get their attention. And then last Sunday evening, uh, we looked at how in the opening verses there clearly existed such a strong bond of affection uh, between the Apostle Paul and uh, the Philippians. Although he had left them, it was as if they were still with him. Uh, they were, verse 5, his partners. Uh, look at verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Uh, well, Paul wasn't in Philippi when he wrote them this letter, but he still felt that they were with him. At uh, this time, uh, we are not with each other as a church, uh, but although apart, there is a sense in which we are still together. Uh, so this morning, I want us to move on to verses 9 to 11. Uh, Paul has been telling the Philippians that he prays for them. And so he comforts the Philippians by telling them that he prays for them. And now, here in verses 9 to 11, he says what it is that he prays for. Firstly, he prays that they would grow in love for each other. So look at verse 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. And now remember something we mentioned last week. Philippians feels like a very happy epistle, but it wasn't completely problem free. At the beginning of chapter four, we find Paul pleading with two ladies. And uh, Paul's prayer then is for these ladies to agree with each other. And so perhaps that explains Paul's prayer. Some kind of problem has come and their love for each other is being tested. And so for us at the present time, this surely needs to be our prayer. A problem has come. We can't meet together. We can't see each other. As some in our congregation have real need. Our love for each other is being tested. And so let's pray that our love for each other would abound more and more. But also this, and now this is surely so relevant for us this morning. Look at how verse 9 goes on. Paul prays that our love would abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. This is the kind of love we need to pray for now. Not only that we love, but that we love with knowledge and all discernment. I think of Jurgen Klopp again. We need to listen to what we're being told to do. It is wise now to be listening to the experts and do what we're being told to do. Uh, but for many people, there's a real frustration about that because we know there are people who are in need of our help and we want to go to them and we want to care for them and we want to serve them practically. 
We want to show our love. But now we need to pray, don't we? For love with knowledge and all discernment. And Paul tells us here that that kind of love with knowledge and all discernment comes from God by prayer. And so in our prayers, let's pray for wisdom, that we grow in love for God and for each other, and that God would give us knowledge and discernment so that we would know how to love at this present time. In verse 10, we also see that Paul prays this for the Philippians. He prays that the Philippians might be able to, uh, verse 10, um, approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Maybe a lot of people at this time are asking what really matters. Uh, there is this awful shadow of death over our society, over the whole world. There's a sense that death has come near. And therefore I need, verse 10, to approve what is excellent. I need to rightly assess what really matters. Uh, think again of those words of Field Marshal Lord Robertson in, in uh, Roberts in, in 1914. Uh, he said, this is not the time to play games. It was a long time coming, but on Wednesday eventually came the confirmation that the Olympic Games have been cancelled. And there's a right sense, isn't there, when death comes close, we realise those things don't really matter. I get one life. What really matters? Well, Paul prays that the Philippians would approve what is excellent. Uh, why? For this reason, verse 10, so uh, you might be ready, uh, approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. What matters is being ready for the day of Christ. Now, the good news of the Bible is this, the Lord Jesus Christ can make you ready for that day. Uh, you might be filled with regrets. Uh, you might think, I wish I'd done things differently. Uh, there was a criminal once who, who hung upon a cross. Uh, he was a man who was guilty of, of real crimes. It's in uh, Luke chapter 23. Uh, he was being put to death by the Roman authorities. He was being crucified. He knew he was a criminal. He knew his life was in the wrong. But next to him, also being crucified, was another man a man who never did any wrong. Next to him was the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this criminal, with all his regrets about what he wasn't and what he should have been, he turned to Jesus, it's, uh, it's Luke chapter 23, and uh, he said to him, um, Jesus, Luke 23 verse 42, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And uh, this was Jesus' answer to that man. He said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now how could that be? How could a bad man, on the day of his death, go to heaven to be with Jesus? He couldn't do anything. On that day he couldn't suddenly live another life. He couldn't start over again. He only had a few hours remaining, painful hours of his life remaining. But this is the point. Jesus could make him ready. At the moment, we need to listen to the advice being given to us. And some of you need to be very passive. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, some of you, especially if you're in any of these at-risk categories, you need to let other people do things for you. You need to let other people bring their shopping to your shopping, to, to your doorstep. Now, stop trying to do everything yourself. Well, that's what we need to do, what we all need to do in relation to Jesus Christ. We need to allow Jesus to get us ready for heaven. I'm not pure and blameless, and nor are you, but he is. And he can give you his purity. He can give you his blamelessness. He can get you ready for heaven. I don't think you can do it. Now, we sometimes sing a hymn. Uh, by Joseph Hart, and uh, the hymn has these words, All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. Uh, Jesus wants you to feel your need of him. He wants you to stop your efforts. He wants you to accept what he gives. What does he give? Well, he gives 
He can give you his purity. He can give you his blameless life, as if it were the life that you lived. He can give you his very life. He did give his very life. He gave it for sinners on the cross, taking the punishment they deserve. Have you gone to him? Have you asked to receive what he gives? Well, Paul also prays this for the Philippians, that they might be, let me turn back to Philippians, that they might be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So don't misunderstand what it is to be a Christian. The Christian is someone who receives all that Jesus gives, but then having received, um, having received what Jesus gives, he produces the fruit of righteousness. I showed you my garden earlier. Um, I filmed that on uh, one week, uh, one, one of the, um, the lovely spring days we had last week. The sky was blue, the sun was shining, and uh, things were starting to grow. Now, all of those plants in my garden, they were put there. At some point, they were planted, and they've grown, and they've produced fruit or flowers. When God plants life in a person, there will be the fruit of righteousness. There will be the evidence of a changed life. I began by telling you of that uh, speech made by uh, Field Marshal Lord Roberts in 1914. This is not a time for playing games. And he was criticising sportsmen for continuing with their games at a time of national crisis. Uh, I read his speech from a book uh, written by um, a colleague of mine. It's a book about sportsmen who fought in the First World War, sportsmen who gave their life um, in the Great War. And um, my colleague there writes in his book about hearts, uh, the Edinburgh football team. In 1914, they were having a terrific season. Um, at the beginning of the, the season, the 1914-15 season, uh, he writes about how they'd won their first 11 matches, I think it was, um, including a victory over Celtic, who were the defending champions. And so support for them were growing. They opened a new stand at their ground. It seemed certain they were going to win uh, the Scottish League. But then, then came the war and uh, the Hearts team famously left their football and signed up for an Edinburgh battalion. And so the book details how many of these men lost their lives or returned home seriously wounded or damaged. There was a, one little detail in one story that fascinated me, the story of Paddy Crossman. Uh, Paddy Crossman was a defender, um, an excellent sprinter apparently, also very good looking. His nickname apparently was the handsomest man in the world. Uh, they said he could pass a ball, but he found it impossible to pass a mirror. Uh, but he was seriously wounded in battle. Uh, he was buried alive after a shell exploded and he had to crawl back to British lines through no man's land. It took him three days. And then at some point it was decided his leg needed amputation and so he pleaded with the doctor, I'm a footballer, I need my leg. And then this is, this is the detail. His leg was saved following an operation carried out by a German prisoner of war. Now I don't know the details of that, but just think of the message of that picture. A leg saved by an enemy. Uh, you've been firing at his friends, uh, but then he saves your leg. Now my point is this, the Christian, having experienced what Jesus gives, will be someone who is filled with the fruit of of righteousness. Where does the power come from to love an enemy? It's easy to be nice to those who flatter you, but how do you love the unlovely? Well, the Christian can. God has planted his life in them. God has planted his love in them. Like the thief on the cross, no Christian deserves what God gives in his son, Jesus Christ. No Christian merits what God gives in his son. And so having received, the Christian is enabled to love the unlovely because being unlovely, he has experienced the love of God. Now, the Christian is enabled to have the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ.
And so is your life now, the end of verse 11, to the praise, uh, to the glory and praise of God? Is God praised now in the love that is now seen in your life? This morning, the greatest need of every man and woman is to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, to receive what he gives. If you are a Christian, is this your prayer? That having received, you would be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Having received, is this now the whole point of your existence? I began asking this question, what really matters? Uh, this is not a time for playing games. Uh, there is a sense in which all of life is not about playing games. I'm not saying it's wrong to play games. But whatever we do, what matters is the glory and praise of God. Is that what you're about? It's what life is about, living for the glory and praise of God. When you do play games, is what matters most whether the, the fruit of righteousness is being seen? Do I play the games with patience and gentleness? Or at this time of coronavirus, what matters is the glory and praise of God. And so is kindness and goodness being seen in me. Having received the life that only he can give, am I praying to be filled more and more with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. There's a poem, isn't there, written by uh, the cricketer and missionary C.T. Studd. And uh, they're simple lines taken from a long poem, uh, but the lines often quoted are these, Only one life twill soon be past, only what's done for Christ will last. Well, we'll close by singing a hymn. Uh, it's, um, it's number 599 if you have a red book, and uh, if you have a white book, it's number 645. And so the hymn is... I lift my heart to thee, Saviour divine, for thou art all to me, and I am thine. Is there on earth a closer bond than this, that my beloved's mine, and I am his?
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen.